Uh, this is Integration of CAM Therapies. My name is Monica Del Rosso. I'm an oncology nurse working at a hospital called Orange Regional Medical Center. It's in Middletown, New York. It's not too far from Sloan Kettering and some of those major hospitals that you heard people talking about. Um, I'm also a Reiki therapist. Um, so the buzz around was, uh, what is CAM therapy? So CAM is uh, an acronym for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Uh, complementary can also be uh, integrative therapies, and uh, they're actually used in addition to your conventional therapies or your traditional therapies. Alternative therapies are those that are used in place of your uh, traditional therapies, and that can be uh, specialty diets and uh, along with maybe some different herbs and uh, vitamins. But for this particular presentation, we're going to concentrate on our integrative therapies or uh, complementary. So our traditional therapies we discussed in the previous session, and they're chemotherapy, immunobiotherapy, targeted hormonal therapies, uh, radiation, surgery, and stem cell transplants. Some of the side effects, and I think we discussed those a little bit earlier, are nausea, vomiting, fatigue, pain, peripheral neuropathies, anorexia. Those are considered our physical ones, and our emotional ones are just anxiety, fear, sadness, grief, depression, and also loss of our physical attractiveness in some cases. So our complementary therapies, we can divide into two different um, sections, natural products, which are our vitamins and minerals, which many of us take on a daily basis, you know, just taking vitamins and maybe vitamin D3 and calcium and, and such. There's also herbs and botanicals. So with herbs, you have your St. John's wort that we use for depression, maybe echinacea to boost our immune system, and the list goes on and on. There's enzymes probiotics, which we use to um, increase our good flora in our uh, gut, and also plant products and essential oils. So essential oils are basically plant products uh, that have been actually pressed, where they uh, press the leaves of the plant until they are able to get the oils out. All of these supplements uh, should be used under the advice of your physician, because in some cases, they can interact with your chemo or biotherapies. And one thing we never want to do is um, increase the efficacy or decrease the efficacy of our chemo. Um, the other type of therapy is mind-body therapy. So the NCCIH defines mind-body interventions as practices that employ a variety of techniques designed to facilitate the mind's capacity to affect bodily function and symptoms. These mind-body practices are techniques that uh, enhance the mind's positive impact on the body. So sometimes we can think of like mind over matter or using your mind to control parts of your body. And basically they're used to uh, support you and to uh, guide you through self-healing also to relax and decrease stress. Some of the mind-body therapies that we'll talk about today are meditation, prayer, guided imagery, and um, you can see the, the list is, is there for you, and we'll go into it in a little bit more detail. So when we're using integrative therapies, the first thing we need to do is decide w which of our symptoms we want to try to control. And these therapies can be, again, separated into maybe three different categories. The first category is um, ones that can be self-taught and used independently of other providers. And they would include meditation, prayer, guided imagery, and acupressure. So when you, you decide, uh, how can I you know, be self-taught in these, there are many um, books or online, there's, believe it or not, things on YouTube that can help you learn to how to do this, and just uh, articles through uh, the internet. 
Then there are therapies that require training and guidance, which would be your yoga, your qigong, your uh, tai chi, and aroma dance and music and art therapies. And then the ones that you really need a uh, trained therapist to uh, treat you with these are Reiki, acupuncture, and massage. So how do we get started? How do we get on our journey to use some of these complementary therapies? Well, one of the first things, especially if you want to do them independently, is to think about how you live your life. You need to have a time during the day where you can actually declutter and be comfortable in your environment. And by this I mean is that we live in this digital age where we always have our cell phone going off, we're Facebooking, we're putting comments on, we're in the car driving and we're taking phone calls. So it's just time to turn off all of those digital appliances and also make a place where you feel comfortable, where it's a calm environment, where you find peace. And it might be in your own home, in your living room, with the use of pillows or candles, or it might be outside in a meadow or in the woods or at the beach, wherever you find yourself comfortable. The second aspect of this is to have presence. And by that I mean is that you are one with yourself. You are there in that particular moment. You're not living, having thoughts of the past, having regrets, and you're not worrying about the future. You're not worrying about getting that food from the food store or what your next treatment will feel like. You are right there in that particular moment. So how do we start meditating? And how do we pray? I think a lot of us here probably pray every day, and we've probably learned how to pray from our parents at a very young age. But we may not have learned how to meditate. So to meditate, really, you need to do what I just spoke about, find a nice place to do it. And you need to uh, just take a few minutes, take some nice breaths, find out how that breathing affects your body and try to clear your mind. And it's a very difficult thing to do. You need to focus on one particular object, whether it's a picture or just something in your mind. And as those thoughts come floating into your head about the past or the future or anything, you're to try to just push those aside and get back to the focus on the particular item that you're focusing on. And as time goes on, you will find that you're able to do it for a longer period of time and that it will also become easier. And you probably will find that you, you use this when you don't even expect to be using it because sometimes the stress of daily living is too much for any of us and we need to just take those five minutes and go to some place that's uh, serene and um, Actually, it's like a security, uh, a uh, secure place, a safety net, and just meditate for those few minutes to clear our heads, and then we're able to come back to everyday living. And prayer, um, I like the, the bottom picture where it says, prayer sends your concerns and requests to the universe, and meditation allows you to hear the answer. And you can also fill in with, you know, prayers are where you send your concerns to your God or your higher being that you believe in. And when you meditate, that's actually when you're getting your answer. And prayers actually clear your mind and bring you inner strength, which is something that we all need. Guided imagery is something that you can teach yourself, and it's something that I've used in my practice as a nurse. Um, I've been able to do um, help people through some of their treatments using this. And it's more than just thinking about a place that brings you comfort. But to start with this, you need to find something that you really like, someplace where you want to be, that you know that has made you happy in the past. But when you use guided imagery, you not only visualize that place, but you're using all of your senses. So you're not just seeing that ocean like in this picture, but you're actually hearing the crash of the waves as they come in and they go out. You might hear a random seagull 
in the background. You feel the warmth of the sun on your body, and you smell the salt air. And this is something, this is another good technique that can relieve stress. And not only can you use this during you know, chemotherapy or radiation treatments, but I've used it myself at the dental office to help me through root canal and fillings and, and, and the such. So it's a very useful technique. <laughs> Heidi's using it right now. <laughs> so now when um, yoga, qigong, tai chi, and uh, dance therapy, these are all using your mind and your body together. It's bringing together meditation, breathing, focus on what we're doing, and, and using your body. So what you actually gain from that is some, some strength, possibly muscle strength. You know, I don't know how long your treatments have been. You might have lost a little muscle tone, and you want to regain it. But what it also gives is it combines meditation and body movement. I will tell you, though, that it could be strenu it, it's not really a strenuous exercise, but it's also something you need to speak to your doctor about before starting, because you want um, his approval. And I wouldn't want any of you to you know, hurt yourselves. Um, aromatherapy, that's the use of essential oils. And many people use those. They diffuse them into their rooms. They have a, a nice aroma. Uh, but the theory behind it is that you're using your olfactory nerves, which are in your nose. It sends a signal to your brain. So if you have something, I'm going to just use the, the, um, the scent of vanilla, because vanilla brings us back to a time where maybe our parents, our mother was making cookies or something. So it, it gives you that um, feeling of warmth um, and, and love, let's just say. So that, that's basically how it's used. Now these extracts can also, these oils can also be used in massage using a, a carrier oil. But I will tell you that before using any essential oils or these products, you need to make sure you don't have any allergies or sensitivities. And that even goes for, uh, you know, like respiratory issues. Because I have known people who have histories of asthma and they come into rooms with uh, aromatherapy and they start to get that itchy, scratchy throat. So just be aware that even though that these are complementary therapies and they have very little side effects, they're still uh, therapies that can cause you some type of distress and you always have to check with your doctor before using. Now, um, the essential oils, there's, there's different oils and they're used for all different um, ailments. In my hospital, if we have somebody who has nausea and vomiting, we will offer them peppermint because we know that helps with that. We use lavender to induce sleep, but they also have other properties. Um, peppermint helps with inflammation, uh, headaches, and the such. And this is something that there are a lot of books out there that uh, distinguish which essential oil is used for which ailment. So it, it can be self-taught, um, but you know, a little guidance along the way is always helpful, and there's a lot of uh, naturopath doctors out there that can help you with that. So now, um, Reiki and acupuncture basically um, work on what they consider the inner energy, which is uh, chi. So they believe that there's energy sources within your body. When you get sick, this energy gets more or less kind of locked in that area. And through the use of a Reiki therapist, they basically help that energy to move to heal you. Uh, with acupuncture, it's meridians. And um, there's something like 14 meridians in the body, and they use their needles in different areas to help unlock that energy and get the energy moving again. So the first picture is uh, basically about Reiki, and that is the uh, seven different chakras that we um, actually use our hands over. Let's just see. So this is a picture of um, Reiki being performed. And I am a Reiki therapist, and I perform Reiki on a lot of my patients. Um, 
our the, the Reiki principles are very nice. Uh, they remind me they're similar to your commandments. So um, if you just want to take a second to read them, but that's the principles that the Reiki therapist lives by. And by allowing all that energy to flow, uh, the patient will become relaxed and have some stress relief. I don't know, Lisa, how, how you felt about it, but my patients all really enjoy it. And, and one thing is when you're having a Reiki treatment done, your Reiki therapist is present in that moment with you. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. And when you're a patient in a hospital, you have constant interruptions in your day. People taking your vital signs, people taking your blood, the diet office coming in, the nutritionalist, people in and out. So when I go in and I offer a Reiki treatment to a patient, we shut the door, we put a sign on it, we put on the music, I lower the lights, and it's just a nurse and her patient. And the, the patients really appreciate that. And it really does reduce stress. And if nothing else, when we reduce stress and anxiety, our pain medication works much better. Because you know that every time that you're really, really stressed out, anything that hurts is going to hurt worse. Because all your muscles tighten up. So on this slide, it also lists all the uh, benefits of Reiki. Uh, I'm not going to read them to you, but uh, they're available on the slides for you. Now, acupuncture. I do not know a lot about acupuncture, but I put this slide on here because I know a lot of people do use it. So um, acupuncture is the use of these thin needles. It's an invasive procedure because it is going through your skin. They use it at strategic points to help with that energy flow. And it, is, um, it comes from Chinese culture and basically is used more to treat pain than anything else. So although the Chinese culture believes that this is, um, um, it helps increase the flow of energy, what we believe now in, with Western practitioners or our own medical doctors, that they use these acupuncture at these particular points because it helps to stimulate nerves and muscles and connective tissue. And a lot of people have had good success with this. And um, I don't want to say it doesn't come with side effects, like opioids might come with a side effect of constipation. You could still have a side effect. You know, it's an invasive procedure. You could have infection. But, you know, if you have a good clinician who's using um, really good skills, you, you shouldn't have that. There, uh, there is a warning when you're using acupuncture that you should consult with your oncologist first and you should verify that that um, acupuncturist is certified. You also uh, would not use uh, acupuncture if you're on blood thinners, if you are pregnant, if you have a pacemaker, or if you have a palpable tumor. So I did list the side effects of this particular therapy, which would be soreness at the site of the uh, needle you could wind up with an infection. And if you are on blood thinners or a baby aspirin or anything of that nature, you could have some bleeding. And the results depend on why you chose to use acupuncture. And basically, uh, they have found that it's the best for pain reduction. Uh, massage. Now, who doesn't like a good massage? Because I know I like a massage. So, but when um, looking for a massage, you should always look for a certified massage therapist. And you, sh again, should consult with your oncologist or primary care physician. And we should not ever um, massage over palpable masses or tumors. We shouldn't use it with individuals with spinal or bone mets or cord compression. Uh, it's used to reduce pain and stress and induce relaxation. There are very few side effects with massage, unless you have somebody who does a too deep massage, and then you might have some muscle soreness following that. So endorphins, they're really good neurotransmitters. And we also know that, I'm sure you've heard that, oh, when you exercise, you release endorphins. It makes you feel better. So I just wanted to go over some other things that help to release those uh, endorphins. 
And one of them is humor. So I don't want any of you to ever forget that watching something funny or listening to a funny story or laughing with your friends is really good medicine. Uh, singing in either a group, a choir, or alone. Uh, dancing, I already mentioned exercise. Meditation, eating chocolate, so there's another good excuse to have a chocolate bar. And also engaging in sex. So I didn't want to elaborate on that. And then, uh, <laughs> and then today we found out that there's a right that the retail shopping for me releases endorphins. So your key takeaways today about complementary therapies are they many of them don't have any side effects, um, whereas you know they can be used with your medication and you don't have to worry about adding yet another side effect of whether it's either constipation or headache or, or whatever. Uh, many of these are based on chi, which means energy, and they, they want to move that energy through your body to help heal you. They can all be used together. You can uh, meditate while using aromatherapy. You can do yoga while using aromatherapy. Um, Basically, you can, you know, pray and then sing. So, you know, you can mix it all up if you need to. And they don't cost too much. Your initial investment is all it really costs. If you have to, you know, go out to a yoga class to learn how to do yoga first, that would be your investment. And then you can use, you know, do yoga in your own home. Uh, so there's not really a financial burden with that. So how would you get started with this? So the first thing you need to do is um, you know, get the proper information to guide you along the way, whether that be through a certified therapist, whether it be through a book. And some um, assistance can be found in the hospitals because a lot of the hospitals use these complementary therapies, the YMCA. I don't know if you have those out here. We have you know, Ys. In, uh, on the eastern seaboard. Uh, they offer yoga. A lot of people are starting to offer Tai Chi. Um, your sen senior places, your municipal places, they all offer these types of things. You can also look to your support groups if you're a member of a support group for your particular cancer. Um, and also through your coworkers, and your family, word of mouth is a big thing. If somebody has used a therapist that they know is good, that's the person you want to go to. You also need to educate yourself. And you can do that through online services, uh, YouTube. But you really need to be careful and uh, investigate, even online, like how reliable that source is. Because not all sources online are reliable. And if you choose to use a therapist, whether it be a Reiki therapist, massage, or acupuncturist, it's, you really need to check their credentials, especially as a, an acupuncturist. And many of those, um, some insurance companies cover that, so that would be another avenue for you to go to. And these are just our references. And I am going to hand over to Heidi now, who's going to talk to you. Thank you.